Hello, good afternoon. You're welcome to Agenda on TV3. My name is Deborah Kwabla. Ghana's triumph at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has been described as a major boost for oil and gas. As Ghanaians celebrate this success, what does this mean for our oil and gas sector? This afternoon on Agenda, we discuss this in detail. And I have in the studio with me three gentlemen who are going to help us to discuss this topic from far left. We have Mr. Chachuchi Katai. He is a senior legal practitioner and a former chief executive officer of the GMPC. Just next by him, we have Mr. Kwame Jantua. He's a legal practitioner, oil and gas expert. He's also the chair, oil and gas sector at the AGI. And on our immediate left, we have Mr. Dr. Eric Odrosa. He's a legal practitioner and a governance expert. Welcome, gentlemen, to Agenda. We we'll start with you, Mr. Chikata. If you could please give us a historical um, perspective of what, how, how we have traveled through this case to this victory? Well, I think that um, sometime in 2014, uh, Ghana decided to go to the International Law of the Sea Tribunal uh, to put this matter on the delimitation of the maritime boundary uh, before the tribunal. And before that, there had been a series of negotiations, um, I think over more than 10 years, There'd been bilateral discussions uh, after Cote d'Ivoire raised some issues. Um, it should be borne in mind that all through that time, I mean, Cote d'Ivoire, in terms of where they had their boundary for the licenses uh, that they granted to uh, companies to explore for oil and gas, they used pretty much the same boundary, but suddenly, Around 2010, they started issuing threats to companies uh, that were working in Ghana in what they now call the disputed area and requiring them to stop you know, working uh, in that area. And so the negotiations were really going nowhere and Ghana decided then to go to the International Law of the Sea Tribunal. In your view, this is one of the best things that we did for the oil and gas sector? No question. And not just for the oil and gas sector. I think it's important to emphasize that this decision delimiting the maritime boundary goes beyond the interests of the oil and gas sector. This is a decisive victory, I would say, for Ghana in terms of maritime territory. Because essentially, in net terms, Ghana actually gains more maritime territory, especially as you go further into the deep water. The, the tribunal uh, based its decision on uh, this equidistance principle, as it's known, which is what Ghana was urging before the tribunal. Now, if you look on the map that was issued um, as part of the tribunal's determination yesterday, uh, it's quite clear that that principle is what was followed completely. And in fact, if you just compare it to another map, which was during the, nego uh, the, the, the uh, presentations of the parties, when Ghana presented a map showing the we, difference. We, 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 we will get into the map and yes. then we'll look at where we were and where we are. F and fair enough. In terms of the redemarcation, where we are likely to be. But going to Mr. Jantua. Uh, Mr. Jantua, is, is the sea an ungoverned territory? We've heard, we've heard things like the territorial waters, exclusive economic zones, and things like that. How is the sea governed? Well, the sea, good afternoon to uh, those watching us. The sea is governed because definitely there are legal uh, uh, statutes and laws that govern the sea. If the sea wasn't governed, we wouldn't be able to have taken it to the, 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 the court, the Hitler's court. And it has proven that there's quite a lot of legal literature and legal legislation that covers the sea. Generally, it's maritime. Oil and gas is maritime. It's just that it's not moving maritime. It's extractive maritime. So yes, without the governing of the sea, we'd have gone to war you know, on, on, on this situation. Other countries have gone to war, but we found it fit to go to, to, to Italy's to have uh, this thing uh, sorted out. So it's not an, a territory that is ungovernable. It is governed. Sometimes some people decide not to take it to the court as we did, and they fight over it. They fight over the territory. 
Um, I'm not sure whether the Cameroon and the Nigerian bit there was some Bukasi, fighting, but Bukasi, yeah, Bukasi, there was Bukasi, some, there was some Bukasi, fighting. Bukasi, yeah, Peninsula. Yes. The Senegal Guinea one, there was no fighting because it went to court. So there are laws that that govern it, and if if you don't go that way, then you're in for you know big trouble in terms of countries fighting amongst themselves. Uh, Dr. Drosai, if if we govern the sea, how come Cote d'Ivoire was disputing the? Uh, boundaries because then if the sea is governed we should have clear demarcation is it a, a failure on our part that our demarcation was not very well known or a, a failure on Cote d'Ivoire's side that they do not have a good understanding of their boundaries um, let me say good afternoon to our viewers um, just as uh, my brother here said uh, the sea is governable and it is governed um, the sea is not like a physical land boundary that you can sit you can see physical landmarks with the sea, um, because the water moves, we use coordinates, and it is part of the international maritime environment. The sea, just like the airspace and the land space, is regulated. The basic regulation for regulating the sea is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And before that convention can come into play, the states must ratify or sign on to it, because it's a convention. Fortunately for us, both Ghana and Ivory Coast signed the convention. Ghana signed the convention on the 7th of June, 1983. Ivory Coast also signed onto it on the 26th of March, 1984. So it means they are subject to uh, the law. Now, it is not as if we did not get it right. Ivory Coast has all along encouraged us to use the angle bisector methods. And we have also thought that there is the need for us to use the equidistant principle. There seems to be some common understanding among the two countries. But along the line... What, what really is the equidistance principle? The equidistance principle is the principle that requires that there should be... Equity must prevail. When you are doing the delimitation, it should be 50-50 to the extent that both countries would benefit. Let me also mention that under the rules... Any time there is a dispute, as far as the maritime area is concerned, we are encouraged to resolve it and ensure that there is equity. So if you approach the dispute on an equitable basis, you are likely to win. Now, in international dispute resolution, there are a number of stages. As our senior here, Mr. Jachikata mentioned, if it starts like that, you go through negotiations. If it fails, you go through inquiry. If it fails, you go through mediation. If it fails, you go through conciliation and fact-finding. If it fails, you go through arbitration. And finally, you put the matter to rest, where the delimitation will be documented. And as he, he rightly said, then it becomes the precedent, then we resolve it once and for all. And then that, that moving that, that, forward that, that, that settles we'll the case. So I think that is what we've been able to do. So once we do that with our, with our uh, border to Ivory Coast, and we do that with Togo, we are ready to go. If, if I may just Wait, add please. something to him. You see, the court did not agree with us because, as my senior said, there, we seem to have, we seem to say, we, we said we had a tacit understanding of that equidistance line. And the court said, there doesn't seem to be any tacit understanding between the two of you. And one of Ghana's claims was that, okay, Please give us the coordinates that we require in simple English. Let, let's, let's go to Mr. Chikata so that we look at the ruling. What did, it, what did we win? Because right. we say we have won. What did we really win? Well, as I indicated earlier, Ghana's position has always been based on this equidistance principle. The equidistance principle, I mean, we don't want to get into too much technical <laughs> jargon. But roughly speaking, the equidistance principle enables a line to be drawn from the shoreline into the sea that is, you know, equidistant as, Please between, feel free to go to the map as, to show as us. between the two uh, territorial areas. So in this, for instance, the first map shows the equidistance. Mr. Chikata, you can actually get up and yes. show us. We, the cameras will yes. pick that. The, 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 from the land boundary point which was identified this BP 55 plus the line went equidistant as between the two mm -hmm. territories now 
And I just want to contrast that to the respective claims that were being made before. Because Ghana's claim, as you can see, based on equidistance, was like that. I, Cote d'Ivoire, angle by sector was like that. And let me say that the angle by sector was not always the claim of Cote d'Ivoire. This was the fourth position that they different positions the tribunal approach was rejected by the court. And the court then drew what they determined to be the equidistance line. Now, there were some technical differences between the exact drawing of our line and what the tribunal did. And I think it's important to understand the reason for those differences. The, the, you know, when you're drawing something like an equidistance line, uh, you have to have certain starting points. You have to have base points on the, you know, the, the coastal area and you use those base points. The tribunal identified the base points that it would use and, and it went into great detail. And, and I, I think without getting into all the technicalities, what's important to emphasize is that this international law of the sea tribunal is the most specialized body within the international jurisprudence that is able to use its technical personnel, mapping experts, and so on, in order to get exactly the delimitation that they regard as the appropriate delimitation. They do the equidistance line. If the equidistance has to be adjusted by reference to certain special circumstances, they can do that also. In this case, they said there were no special circumstances to adjust the equidistance line, so they did exactly that. Now, Ghana indeed had earlier also put as an alternative position that given the history of Cote d'Ivoire's practice, they had basically agreed tacitly to a certain boundary line. Now, the, the, the tribunal said that maritime boundaries are not determined just by oil concession practice. And that is indeed also recognized in international law. But effectively, what the tribunal did was to use that principle regarding the equidistance line, which Ghana had been urging, contrary to the uh, angle by sector. So if the angle by sector had been used, then of course, things like the 10 fields and so on would have gone into Cote d'Ivoire's territory, but that didn't happen because Ghana was comprehensively adjudged not to have violated any of the territorial rights of Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana was a judge also to have, you know, going beyond just the limits of oil concessions, the whole of the continental shelf, you know, beyond the 200 mile limit, Ghana's equidistance, the line that was uh, uh, drawn went all that way. And that's why I said that in the end, this actually provides Ghana more maritime area than previously claimed because on the basis of what Ghana had referred to as a customary line that was being used for oil concessions before, um, you know, when you go further into the deeper water, it moves somewhat eastwards towards, you know, the Ghana side. But now it moved a little bit to the so west in the more, deep water. More. So there's actually some more value. But the reason I mentioned earlier that we shouldn't limit it to oil practice is because really this also concerns things like fisheries. And these are all important aspects of the sovereign rights of nations. You know, being able to have access to uh, uh, maritime territory for fisheries you know, is very vital. And we do have a great tradition of, of fishing in Ghana. And, and, and so we should look at this more comprehensively beyond the oil and gas sector, or even though it is very vital for the oil and gas sector because of the certainty that it now brings to companies that have been working in the area. And that is readily shown in how uh, excited Talo Oil, for instance, feels about the result. You know, they immediately put on the website the map and they relate it to the, um, the, 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 the uh, 10 fields and show clearly that none of the 
fields that they're developing, those three fields called the 10 fields, none of them falls within Cote d'Ivoire's territory. And we can show the map that also reflects that from, from Talo's announcement yesterday. So that is what is important from Ghana's point of view, that we, we are have, now... We have that map yes, on, on exactly. the screen. Yes, exactly. So, so you can see that um, this was from Talo's uh, press release yesterday. All the fields that they're developing currently, the, the, the one that went into production earlier this year, which is uh, producing some 50,000 barrels a day, all of them are east of the uh, equidistance line. That's, that's very if, important. If Mr. Jensen, like yes, if please. I'd like to go back to the other map which showed the um, Ivorian case mm -hmm. on the sector, if you'd like to go back to that map. Yes. So, not this one, the other one. Yeah, okay, this, this one. one. So, in here, in here, we have HES. Yes. Oh. HES have five... Mr. Jonathan, if you could please come closer and then we can okay. project the screen okay. because of the mic. HES have five, they found five discoveries mm -hmm. associated, three discoveries non-associated. Mm -hmm. Associated means there's oil and gas in those mm -hmm. five blocks. Okay. Non-associated means there's gas. That is ultra deep waters. Now, looking at the way the Ivorian case is, all that would have gone, at least half, half of, of that, that field would have, gone. would have gone. This is a huge win for huge, Ghana. Huge win. Now, to add to what our senior said about fisheries, it was a point that they raised when you read uh, the judgment. It was a point, they asked whether Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, during the time of the uh, questioning, whether Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire had a fisheries policy between them. And there wasn't. there wasn't. So I'm sure that also contributed in setting the line the way they set it. And yes, it is true. It now covers fisheries. The other point is that in so doing, does this now cover the other side in terms of Togo? Mm. That's something that... that that's a question you should be, yes. should be giving us answers to. <laughs> but that's, the tribunal it said so. The yes. tribunal said that this is an adjudication between two parties. Yes. Ghana it has nothing to do with, with the other things. Because, in fact, Cote d'Ivoire did try to bring in Togo and Benin at the last minute in order to complicate the picture a little bit and say that if the equidistance uh, line is used, then it will have certain negative consequences for Togo and Benin. And the tribunal stated very clearly in its judgment yesterday that this decision is a decision between Ghana and, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. The coastal area involving Ghana and Togo looks different geographically and so on. And each case is determined according yes, to the geography yes. in respect of the, the maritime boundary. So there are going to be different issues with Togo and Benin. I, I, I can't you know, anticipate all those issues in this short discussion because what the tribunal concentrated on was the shape of the coastlines of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And, Ghana. and that is why, in fact, they made it also clear that this would not apply, for instance, say, to Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia. Liberia, to the west of Cote d'Ivoire, because, again, you have to look at the circumstances of all those areas. So I, I, I think, you know, the tribunal showed itself to be indeed the most competent judicial body, the most authoritative body that deals with these matters. It's also important just to highlight something. You know, we as lawyers, sometimes we kind of uh, tend to behave as if it's only a lawyer's matter, but in fact it's not. I think the role of the mapping experts in relation to cases like this is really something that is very critical. And I think that what we can also um, you know, give credit for in relation to how this whole thing has been handled at the Ghana end is that, you know, the Attorney General, then Attorney General uh, uh, Marietta um, ensured that there was sort of historical knowledge of where the line had been drawn and so on. Uh, people in, in, you know, Petroleum Commission, people 
Environmental Protection okay. Agency. M M M Mr. Oh. If you could please please round up on that. I wanted to pick Dr. Drosai's thoughts and then we'll come back to how we handle the case. But if you could yes. conclude that for I, me. I'm just trying to point out that there are multiple disciplines involved mm. and all these contribute to an ultimate legal conclusion. That's very important. Mr. Drosai, Dr. Drosai, I beg your pardon. How, what's your initial comments about the win, especially in a layman's term? What does it mean for a Ghanaian on the streets? Well, Ghana went to the courts um, with three reliefs. It's important we take it from there. The first one is that they want the tribunal to delimit in accordance with the principles and rules set forth in, under the UNCLOS the complete course of the single maritime boundary dividing all the maritime areas appertaining Ghana and the Côte d'Ivoire in the Atlantic Ocean, including in the continental shelf and beyond the 200 meters. It is important to let members or people watching us understand that under international law, uh, Ghana is a coastal state. Coastal state because we have a coast in front of us, so I just think that. Aside from that, we also have the exclusive economic zone, which is about 200 nautical miles, within which all resources in there belong to us, we can manage it. Ghana further went to the courts and then asked the tribunal to determine the precise geographical coordinates of the single maritime boundary in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's what they've done. Now, to us, the big win is that almost every single relief we sent to the tribunal has been attained. I mean, we've, we, we, we've gotten it, and it is very good. What is left for us is to publish it or document it. This chart has been developed by a kind courtesy of Talo, but I can tell you that Ghana as a country would also have to develop one. We can ride on what Talo has developed. No, no. But no, when no, you go no to I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I yeah. do need to intervene there. Uh, Please go ahead. It's not only Talo who has developed this. I mean, I know, that, I know that the GMPC, for instance, already have mm -hmm. their map yeah. out because the coordinates are there, are there for GMPC. So They've been there. Okay. And plans. they have been involved in the case. Type of coordinates map. Because we have, the G with the other we have the GNPC one, we have the Talo one. But when you go to Article 84 of the UNCLUS, the UNCLUS is clear that once you have this, you have to publish it. You have to publish the chart and even deposit a copy with the Secretary General of UN. So going forward, that's what we need to do. Then after that, we can start the sensitization and then awareness raising. Hmm. Mr. Chantua, the way we went about the case... We saw a lot of collaboration, especially between the two attorney generals. And Mr. Chikata has already mentioned the issue around partnership with other stakeholders. Did that contribute to our win? It looks like we work very closely together. We couldn't have played partisan politics with this. No way. It wouldn't have helped us in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There was a transition from one party to the other. This was a case that affected Ghana, and it affected Ghana's revenue. We couldn't have played politics with this. Mm. And yes, it goes to show that all our people, especially in GMPC, who have been trained all these years, the, the, the knowledge that they have gathered contributed immensely to the way they put their case. And that is the key, how they put their case. We have won. We presented a good so case. we presented a good case and there was good collaboration. And look, let us not uh, uh, feel that there's always uh, uh, some kind of uh, anonymity between parties. It only happens on television, it only happens in the media. But they work together. They work together. It was, and I wouldn't want to even talk about any party in there. They were Ghanaians. And for me, this is a good test. And there's something about Ghana. When something like this happens, we don't build on it in other sectors, in other areas. It happens, and then we park it somewhere, and then we go back to what we are used to. I think this is a good litmus test because the two presidents were involved. In fact, three presidents were <laughs> involved. The late uh, Dr. Mills, uh, Dr. Professor Mills, Mills. Uh, Professor Mills, 
uh, Professor Maha, uh, Dr. Mr. Mahama yeah. and Akufuado. Two attorney generals were involved. There were people who had worked in the past administration and in the present administration who were part and parcel of it. There are some who were no more there who, who for instance, Alex Mould, at the time he was GMPC uh, uh, MD. They helped pay. They helped pay the lawyers for this particular uh, 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 event. And so I feel we have collaborated, we have worked together. Let's use it in other areas. Let's take a lesson from it and use it in other areas. And perhaps there are certain things we can come, come, come together and conclude on. And for me, it's a good example of how parliaments should work. Very good example of how parliaments should work. If there are certain things that affect the country and even one party seems to have an upper hand in their argument, but that argument does not help us solve whatever challenge, let's come together. It's one Ghana. It's one Ghana. Mr. Shikata, what would we have lost if we had lost this case? Well, you know, there were in fact some people who at the stage of the provisional measures in April 2015, who were being very critical of the Attorney General for her advice to the President to take this matter to Italy. Let's be honest about this. And the, 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 the line of those people was suggesting that this was too risky because Ghana stood to lose, especially at a time when the 10 fields were being developed and you know there was, uh, at a certain stage, even a mistaken interpretation of the provisional measures as if Ghana was no longer going to develop the 10 fields and things like that. I mean, I mentioned this whilst agreeing completely with what Kwame said, but I mentioned this just to say that we also have to take some lessons. I mean, I think the people, including some lawyers who took some of those positions, they need to go, go and give back the former Attorney General Stone <laughs> to her, as we say. No, I mean, really, because I mean, she worked not just by herself, but with a very international team. That's the other thing that I want to emphasize. A very international team of lawyers. You know, this is a very specialized area. As anybody reading that 181-page uh, judgment uh, will attest to. And so you can't depend just on Ghanaian lawyers. There were senior Ghanaian counsel, you know, Fuichi Kata and... Uh, some, uh, uh, in addition to the Attorney General's department, the Solicitor General, and so on. But we had to have some international lawyers who are specialized in the practice before this tribunal. There is nothing wrong with using such international expertise. I mean, even in soccer, countries have uh, soccer coaches from uh, other countries. <laughs> so so, so I think that, um, you know, we, we ought indeed to build on the lesson, as Kwame rightly said. And in that respect, let me say, you know, that we, we endowed with capacity. Capacity transcends politics or partisanship. There are, you know, people with capacity in any party. I mean, I was going to say NDC MPP, but I know he's a CPP <laughs> man, so you <laughs> want me to mention CPP. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think the beauty of this country lies in us being able to harness all the resources that are available, no matter the political party thing. And, and I think this coming... Um, at this time, within a couple of days of Founders' Day, yes. is a great <laughs> tribute also to our, our founder and uh, the vision that he had for Ghana's uh, future. If I, if I may, yes, please, may briefly. Also, uh, we've, we've talked about um, the kind of communication and way we have conducted ourselves, but let's look at the other side in terms of the revenue. So, if it so happened that we had lost or yeah. Ivory Coast had gained their line. Quite a bit of 10 project. Would what would have gone? gone? If you could just hold it right there, we'll go for a break. When we come back, we'll get into what we would have lost as a country if we had lost this. And then moving forward, what we can learn to make sure that we can be victorious as Ghana. We'll be back shortly.
You're welcome back. This is still Agenda on TV3. We are discussing Ghana Côte d'Ivoire judgment that was given at the Itlos. Mr. Janta, before we went on break, you were talking about what we would have lost as a country yes. and if I, we had lost this case. Yes, and I was saying between 2011 and 2016, more 2016, because where 2016 is concerned, because of the FPSO challenges, uh, we got some hydrocarbons and gas from the 10. We have made 3.4 billion dollars for Jubilee alone. So you can imagine, 10 was in full production, Hess was in full production, we would have lost a lot of revenue. It would now come to affect the economy if only we only look at even the four priority areas within the law. Those four priority areas out of the 13 in the PRMA, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, which the minister is supposed to choose for oil revenue investment. The ones this is for the next three years, agriculture, which is key, education, which is key, health, which is key, and for me, the most important one is rail and road infrastructure. So imagine that the Ivorian line had been chosen. A lot of revenue coming into the economy would have you know, been very difficult for us to make up. But you see, the one thing that this does, yes, we have won, we should intensify oil exploration within the other fields within our own gamut. So, basin, we need to now have a exploration blocks that have been given to other companies and other companies for the past three years haven't done anything with it because they don't seem to have the capacity and capability. Let GMPC take it back and give it to those who can do it so that we can accelerate our oil production. Right now, I mentioned Togo because Togo, we don't know whether they're going to come up with their own because it looks as if the line... So what should we do? What, what should well, we do with we, the Votarium Basin? Well, well, How should the, we well, well, deal well, with it before we well, start the Keta getting Basin, in there? We need to now fortify that too. And also, you talked about Voltaire Basin. We have a very porous coastline. We need to fortify a coastline because if we start finding oil onshore, which is right on the border with Togo, we can have the Niger Delta situation too onshore. So for this should be a litmus. It should be a test for us to to make sure we fortify all our borders. I'm not as pessimistic. Production. I'm not as pessimistic <laughs> as Kwame. Um, I think if we look at the experience with Cote d'Ivoire, even though um, there were disagreements. We really never, it never became a source of acrimony in any major way. I think under President Mills, as um, Kwame referred to earlier, there were discussions between the two presidents. There were indications of the Cote d'Ivoire, new positions that were emerging, and there was some pressure being brought to bear. But again, the steps that are necessary to address that are the steps that were taken from those days. Yeah. We emphasized the institutional collaboration at the Ghana and that was needed to get all our act together. We brought on board technical expertise at that time, two professors, uh, Kwame Mfojo uh, from uh, an Australian university, Martin Chamayi, who had experience in this area of you know, maritime issues were brought on board. Kwame Mfujo became a full-time you know, member of uh, the government in terms of advising on this area and coordinating with all the different institutions. I, I really helped. want to emphasize the importance of Ghana getting its act together, not so much in terms of fortification, that sounds too military, <laughs> but, but really just in terms of making our own assessment and really going from there. Some of the companies that were working near the Côte d'Ivoire uh, border, for instance, in a sense, I would say took advantage of the dispute situation to say that their activities should be put on hold until the border dispute has been resolved. Now the dispute has been resolved, so they, can so they now have the responsibility to show us that they're willing to undertake mm. the things that they've committed to undertake. Dr. Odrosai, the Votarium Basin, we've had experience with Côte d'Ivoire, so how should we prepare towards that? I think we should quickly do an assessment of the situation and then take the necessary steps. If we think that there is a need for us to 
bring finality on that one too. That we can initiate the move. After all, um, the case between us and Ivory Coast, we took it to the high loss. So if we think that we want to bring finality to bear, in our relationship with uh, Togo too, we can do the same to that. But let me come to what we were to lose. You, look at, you remember the Bakasi Peninsula. Nigeria spent more than $300 million, yet they lost. You know? So if we had lost, we're going to lose a lot of things, including the monies we spent on the professional team, as well as direct and indirect investments. Because when you look at onshore and offshore investments, goes into this oil business and then the gas issues. You know? So it was good we won. But I think that what we need to do going forward is mm. I've heard that the two statements, the two countries, mm. have already issued a joint statement uh, indicating their commitment. Is that a, is that a good sign? Is this a How good should sign? should be reaching out? We are at the winning side. No, but if, they, if, are, if they, like they, they issued side. a joint statement I mean, before they left Germany, it's a, it's a good sign that they are prepared to work together towards implementing the decisions of the court. So I think it's a good sign. But we should also be very careful in our celebrations. There are neighbors who continue to be neighbors, continue to work together, and then make sure that we produce our map, publish it as required by law, and then do the sensitization as required. You see, yes. if, if, if it went for the British who came and the French who came <laughs> into our, our area, we will be brothers and sisters. Definitely. You go to Cote d'Ivoire, mm. there are Ivorians there who speak Akan. You go to Volta, we speak the same language. Mm. So really, I don't see us... Uh, having mm. any kind of altercation or quarrel over this. But, but, but we, had, we had a number of failed attempts in resolving the issue, and so 10 of them, and so if, irrespective of the way we look at it, there will be some pain, but the court, and we are, we are, we are court, celebrating. But when the court was giving its ruling, it did say that both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire had shown a good sense mm -hmm. of discussion, mm -hmm. a good sense of negotiation. Mm -hmm. a good Does that sense deal with that, the pain? Well, the it's pain to some extent. Uh, uh, well, it's it's not as if we have left them and we are shouting, "Whoa, oh, no!" But we are we are, we are still holding hands. We we have to come on. They would have celebrated. Do you know the amount of money? Look, ten alone, sixty billion barrels. It's not chicken feed, and if the oil price starts going up and we can maximize the quantum of oil we're exporting. And even for most importantly, is the gas for electricity. We would have lost a lot. It could have even happened that down the line, Doomsa would have come back again. Because right now, we are depending on gas from the 10 uh, fields. So we would have lost a lot, both financially and with regards to our economy and how Ghanaians could have found a bit of easiness in living. Mm -hmm. So. The fact that they have lost doesn't mean we are still not friends. I'm sure we will still collaborate. There are certain things we will do together. There are certain things we will discuss together. One of the major things is uh, border security and the terrorism thing that we're seeing within West Africa. We need to collaborate on it. I don't think the fact that they have not gained what they were looking for should stop us from you know, still working together. Mm. And, and I, I, I think when, when you look at it also just historically, you can't really say Cote d'Ivoire has lost anything because all these 10 fields and so on were invested in because of Ghana's efforts to but, but promote they the have, companies. They, they, they wouldn't have invested in yeah, the case let, if let, they thought they were going to lose. No, let me explain this. What, what I'm trying to say is that genuinely, I don't think Cote d'Ivoire have much that they can grieve about mm -hmm. because these were areas that Ghana had put in the effort in order to get the investments, to get the exploration undertaken in. I mean, we still have a lot of opportunities for collaboration. You know, GMPC and Petrosy have over the decades discussed collaboration. Fields. Being shared amongst four or five fields then it becomes possible to produce them economically. And there have been initiatives in that regard over the years. These initiatives can be continued. They may have halted at a point in time when their claims began to be escalated in terms of you know, the noise and the threats to companies. But now that the, the delimitation has been done decisively, it is an opportunity to 
collaborate to do the things that have been under discussion between the two national oil companies. Mm. Doc, th this is very important, the relationship, uh, managing the relationship and discussion is very important because we know the International um, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea does not have an enforcement mechanism. So what if, you know, how do we manage that to make sure that we can go through the, the relationship nicely? See, to the, the starting point was the joint statement the two countries mm -hmm. issued. I think it's, it's, it's a sign of good faith. It's a sign that they are prepared to go by the recommendations or the rulings of the court. So let us move from that level to the next level. I mean, when they all come back to Ghana, there should be a joint meeting, either in Ghana or in Cote d'Ivoire, and then we can come up with a roadmap towards implementing the court's decisions. So I think but well, we should go ahead and then run sensitization programs, awareness raising program, explain things to people so that the laymen and women in the field can also understand. because. The uh, issues about this particular ruling are so technical that we need to break it down for people to understand. Exactly. And rightly so. The technical people in the area can understand. But how about the others? So we need to do further sensitization. I know GNPC has a role to play. And then other oil companies, they also have a role to play. Both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we have roles to play to ensure that we can implement this particular ruling successfully. They say, they say the best comes from the West. Mm. <laughs> and it, it was quite fascinating to me when... I, I wasn't sure whether he was mentioning the right name when he said Jomoro. You know, one of the, the judges, yes, yes. he said Jomoro. Yes. And I listened to it again, and he kept repeating Jomoro. And it was a question about Jomoro being a peninsula. Mm. The moment they, you know, he made the comment that Jomoro is part and parcel of Ghana, exactly. I knew the tables had, had changed. Now, even on that coast, onshore, there's a field that straddles both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, onshore. And so definitely there's going to be a lot of uh, chance for us to collaborate on this oil, oil and gas situation. So I don't think after what Cote d'Ivoire has gone through in terms of war, they would want to start that again. I think in Ghana, the, the, war we've, the only war we've been to is a coup. We really don't know how, 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 I'm, I'm not sure how they, to they, fight. They, 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 they may want to try. No, I don't no, think I don't so. I don't think so. Mr. Shikata, our roadmap. Well, I believe be that um, it's quite clear that we now have this very authoritative determination of our boundaries. We have an authoritative indication to all the investors in oil and gas, particularly, that this is where the boundary is and Ghana has been already compliant with that boundary. Um, we do need to ensure that there is an acceleration of um, investment activity and also of our own sort of independent initiatives if we're going to get the benefits of the oil and gas. Um, I think Kwame mentioned earlier the importance of the gas resource. Uh, oil companies who are investing are usually focused on oil, um, not on gas. So it has to be a national initiative that really focuses on gas. And, you know, that was indeed one of the um, important elements in the, the GMPC law that, you know, there should be a focus on developing the gas resources for national purposes as well. So, you know, I think that... The, it's not as if it's a new roadmap, really. <laughs> the roadmap has been quite clear in terms of what we try to do with our oil and gas resources in order to maximize national benefit. But I still want to emphasize that this goes beyond oil and gas. I think that we should begin to pay more attention also to our fisheries and the potential of our fisheries. I think maybe on the basis of this decision, highlighting the, the, the fisheries uh, element uh, of, of the jurisdiction that we now have in this area, we should pay more attention to that because... Is this, is this calling for more patrol of, of our No, waters? I'm not talking about patrol. Necessary. First of all, I'm just talking about our own knowledge of the resources of the sea. Yeah. You know, the resources of the sea are not just oil and gas. And, and fisheries are important. Fisheries are important also just to our daily livelihood and to the livelihood of many uh, fishing communities along the coastline. So, so the kind of sensitization that um, Dr. Sai was talking about, I, I think should also 
relate to the activity of the coastal communities mm -hmm. and the interest that they have in this whole thing. I mean, there have been times when we've been worried about the fact that f fishing uh, boats are coming too close to, you know, oil installations. Mm -hmm. But we have such a vast area. So if there's a way of ensuring that the, the fishing communities see the scope of the area and the scope of the resources in that area, then I think we would be making valuable use of what we've learned from this judgment, this very important and authoritative judgment of the tribunal. I do want to mention one point that I forgot earlier. This was a unanimous decision yes. of the tribunal. Mm -hmm. And the, the tribunal was composed of three you know, permanent members of that tribunal and two ad hoc members, selected one by Cote d'Ivoire and one by Ghana. Uh, Ronnie Abrams, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Dr. Mensa, and Ghana. all of them ruled all of in them favor of Ghana. Ruled in favor that, of that's Ghana. A very that's a very decisive important. decisive victory yes, yes. For, for the country. Mr. Janto, how should we manage our fisheries? Because we've gained some mileage, we need to develop this further so that the coastal communities can benefit. Well, how should we well, I, pack I wasn't it? only even looking at fisheries alone. There's a lot of tourism and entertainment we can do on the sea. This is one judgment that we should now focus our minds on. Can develop yes. that side. We should look at how we get our, our fisher folk good equipment. Because you get trawlers coming into our mm -hmm. seas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to fish the rich natural resource fish we have. And we sit and we do absolutely nothing about it. And they complain. They require some more patrols they as complain. well. They it's, it's not even... Do, do we have, the Navy, do we have the capacity to make sure that we can prevent look, trawlers you, look, invading if, our look, waters? if you put your mind to something, you will do it. And for me, I think we have, we, we have, we have, we have, we have been a great disservice to our fisher folk. They have been in this business for a long time. Look, when we found oil and gas in the western region, Let's even take only tallow. And we were looking for divers. Could we not have trained some of these fisher folk because they were used to the sea to be divers? But we rather brought divers from outside. And we even stopped them from fishing in the areas that they knew. I mean, it's not right. We should be able to develop the fishing industry, the entertainment industry. Go to Nigeria today. You should see the yachts that are on just even the rivers within Lagos alone. Can't we do it here? Go to Ada. How many yachts do you see there? Hardly any. The mindset should change because if we are able to develop the resource in terms of the sea, the added value in terms of revenue that's going to come in is going to be huge. I went to uh, Keta the other day to do verification of Piak. Uh, projects, oil revenue that has been invested in projects, Piak we are supposed to monitor. And just in Keta, looking at the way the topography is, the, the geographical uh, setup is, and the water so that surrounds the land, very beautiful. And I was beautiful saying to myself, sure. if this were Spain, no black man could have come there. <laughs> <laughs> but there we are, we've left it. <laughs> doing absolutely nothing with it. And you even look at the sea defense wall that we have put up. It's neither here nor there. And so for me, we should not only celebrate the decision and the victory, we should now build on that victory so that people who do not have the wherewithal to go to university, but have the wherewithal to be fisher folk, have the wherewithal to walk, work in our waters, should also get some added value from what has happened. It's not only money but it's got to do with getting employment for people. We are talking about jobs, jobs. It's not only factory jobs that you talk about. The sea is a huge yes, area yes. that can employ a lot of people. Let's put our, our hands to the task. And yet again, I would say, let us not use partisan politics where this is concerned. Dr. Dross, I, think, I think if you have a president who is open-minded, you should be able to call others around the table and say, how do we do, we do it? This? How do we replicate this in other sectors? Because very clearly we use a bipartisan approach. It worked well. We've talked about it a few times. How should we look at this as a lesson learned, critical lesson that we we'll replicate in other sectors? I think going forward... Resources. 
to the benefit of all Ghanaians, bring everyone on board. If there are certain skills, expertise that you don't have in your government, extend an olive branch to the others and let them come in. It's very important because we are building a common nation. And let me also say that in marine resources are marine resources. It is not only oil and gas. You know, so it will call for sustainable utilization, sustainable management, so that at least we'll be able to derive maximum benefit from the marine resources. The onclus is there to manage the entire the mar marine space. So let us take advantage of that and then make sure that at least as a nation, we're able to put our human resources together, we're able to put our acts together, we're able to achieve what we want to achieve from this. This is a landmark ruling and it will go to help all of us. It has put to rest the delimitation lines and let us... All the way to the shore. Definitely. But the critical is, resources. Is, is, is give, it, give me your is final it, thoughts. Is it, is it true that there's a block in the Côte d'Ivoire side that we might have an advantage to? That, well, let's... let's, 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 let's potentially, potentially. Potentially. The, actually, as you go into deeper water. Yeah. But I, I'd like to say that for me, one of the most memorable images in regard to this whole process was the image of the current Attorney General, Gloria Kufo, being introduced by the previous Attorney General, Marietta uh, Buapi Opong, to the tribunal for the last session in February, thereabouts. And we saw and some photos, very I think, photos. you know, having these two powerful ladies uh, be the face of Ghana must have contributed to that description of the elegance of the proceedings. <laughs> Uh, by, by in the judgment, uh, uh, after the judgment, in the comments that were made by, by the president of the tribunal. I think we all should feel very proud of um, these, uh, not just these ladies as individuals, but what they represent and the various institutions that have all played a role. And, and I believe that, as, as, as um, was, was said earlier, um, the president has a whole array of these institutions as at, at his disposal in order to prosecute the agenda of the nation. So, John, give me your last words. I think the fact that gender has played a huge role in this success <laughs> is fantastic for me. That's important. I think we shouldn't, uh, we, we, we tend to put our, our women in the background, but I think this has shown it's that too strong, women, women have the same capabilities as men in a court. box i think let it be a lesson for us all and I, I i hope that we would not leave important things like this for 10 years before we have to go to court whatever it is let's deal with it now for instance one of the things i think we should start dealing with and maybe my senior will be able to educate me is the mapping of the voltaic basin mm. Because the present moment, if it so happens that we find oil and gas in the yeah, whole Voltaire Basin, that's Galamse oil and gas coming up. Mm -hmm. Because you do not need the account, amount of money mm -hmm. you need to buy a FPSO to, for, get to, the, to, 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 get to do to Voltaire. Basin. You just need a donkey head and a, a, a reservoir. And, then and you that's are, it. And, and you can yeah, find oil. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we need, to start we need to start mapping out that area. Where is agriculture going Round to be? Where is uh, uh, mining going to be? So that when we start the production, mm. we are not in, in, in dire straits. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Mr. Chachuchikata. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jantua. And thank you very much, Dr. Ripo Drosa. If, if, if I may just add, when this, thing, this, when this thing started, I remember we were the first people who were interviewed, was it four years, five years four ago? Four years ago. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, and it's, it's good to have you back Thank you. Uh, after the victory. Thank you very much for being part of this discussion. My name is Deborah Kwabla. God willing, same time next week, we will be here. We'll bring you another discussion. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye.